welcome to Vacation Station, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. everybody, welcome to Big Blend Radio's Vacation Station food, wine, and travel show with your host Nancy Reed and Lisa Smith, where the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of the digital interactive Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. It's our variety quality of life publication, and we also publish Parks and Travel magazine, which of course you cover, it's Parks and Travel, and it also includes our Love Your Parks tour, where we travel full-time across the country getting all kinds of cool stories. You can keep up with us at bigblendmagazines.com. Uh, today, very excited, we're going to be talking about beautiful Paso Robles, um, Robles, I think everyone says it a little different. Uh, Nancy and I had the opportunity to drive through it, so now we need to stop <laughs> on our way up to cent uh, Central California, up in Hollister area a couple years back, and it is part of the uh, Juan Batista de Anza National Historic Trail, so we're very excited to learn more about this wonderful destination known for all of its wineries. I think over 200 wineries, which is amazing. Uh, there's beaches, there's history, there's art, all kinds of great things to experience. And it's right between San Francisco and LA, uh, so an easy destination to get to. Uh, today, our special guests, we have Christopher Toronto from the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance. And uh, you can see that, go to pasowine.com. And we have Dana Stroud from Travel Paso, and you can go to travelpaso.com uh, to learn more over there. But first off, welcome, Dana. How are you? Uh, we're excellent. Uh, excellent this morning. It's a, it's a beautiful fall morning here in Paso. Oh, now is it nice. Paso Robles or Paso Robles or? Yeah, well, uh, all, all of the above. Uh, Paso, among our locals, that's how we refer to ourselves. Um, Paso Robles is the... Um, pronunciation that we grew up with. And then El Paso de Robles is the um, official name and represents the, the Spanish history that we have here. So uh, you, you, it's not wrong for all three, but uh, Paso is, is what we call it. And Paso Robles is how we grew up pronouncing it. Okay, great. And that Spanish cool. history, that ties into the Anza Trail that you're part of. Uh, do it, people come and stop and, and you know get their passport books stamped at the missions? Yes, they do. And in fact, in Paso Robles, we've got three missions that are nearby um, San Luis Obispo, which is 30 miles south of us, and then Mission San Miguel, which is just right outside of town. And then the third one is Mission San Antonio, that's about a 45 minute drive from Paso. So in this area, uh, those passports can get three stamps uh, because of the missions that we have right here um, accessible to us. And when there's missions, you know that there's wine. And that's what Chris is doing here. Chris, welcome. How are you? Hi, good. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Is it true there's 200 wineries? It is. Yes, we have Yay. 200 wineries in our area. We've been uh, on the growth pattern here for quite some time. But uh, we say 200 wineries, of course, but in actuality, there's probably about 140-ish wineries that you can, or tasting rooms that you can actually go to and, and see and, and taste at physically. The rest are just other, you know, brands that exist here that might not have that kind of place where a, a visitor can actually come and experience their wine. You know, over the years, uh, we've interviewed a lot of uh, travel writers, wine writers, and I got to give a shout out to uh, the International Food Wine Travel Writers Association, IFTWA, uh, for introducing us to you. Um, but they talk about there's like, whenever they've gone out to Paso that they find these tiny wineries and sometimes they're really lucky to get in and um, be able to, you know, get that that sip right there and it's not really always open to the public so it's kind of like you have to go downtown for that kind of experience right for those wineries that are closed off yeah a lot of the wineries that are in the downtown area oftentimes are just they're maybe so far removed as far as their their um, home ranches from town that they find a better opportunity to be where there's going to be a little bit more foot, foot traffic mm. then there are some brands actually who simply are brands that don't have a home type ranch or vineyard and are simply a winemaker sourcing fruit, making wine at a winery that isn't necessarily open to the public. And so they need a retail place to be able to sell their wines and, uh, and meet, meet the people that enjoy them. Mm. And uh, over, we're talking about, you know, here's the 200 wineries, uh, whether, you know, the 140 to 200 wineries, 
Um, what's interesting, I, I was reading up that um, this is, to me, it's, it, it looks like it's been growing really, really fast because it, isn't it um, started like the AVA came into being in like the end of the 80s? 1980s? It actually was 1983 is when our AVA or American Viticultural Area first started. And back then we were 17 wineries and about 5,000 vineyard acres. Um, mm -hmm. As we grew over the years, um, we have now, now we say 200 wineries, of course, because there's so many brands actually, I should help qualify that. There's so many brands that exist, say on a store shelf or something like that somewhere, that if you were to come to Paso to say, oh, I want to go to their tasting room, they, they don't necessarily have a tasting room. They're just mm. kind of, you know, but so now 200 wineries and about 41,000 vineyard acres. Wow. Um, with about 64 different varietals being grown in our region. Uh, and so that makes for, a, you know, a lot of diversity and a, a lot of fun that we are able to not necessarily hang our hat on one variety, but enjoy our diversity of varietals to say that we, you can get Cabernet Sauvignon here, you can get the Rhone varieties, you can find Italian wines, you can find Spanish and, and so many other things, Zinfandel, of course, being our heritage varietals as well. Wow, Nancy, Zinfandel. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Yay. We're, we're both like, okay, this sounds like a happy place. Um, but but is the, does the history go back before the 80s in regards to, you know, did the missions when, you know, those were getting set up, was there wine coming into, um, into fruition or into fermentation? Oh, it sure does, yeah, absolutely. You know, with the, with the mission system, of course, that being the way the mission grape, as it was called back then, of course, it has a, a different... Ample, well, the ampelology actually goes way back into being, I believe, Criollo originally um, brought over from Europe, and then it made it over into like New Jersey or something like that, and then eventually made it to uh, California. And then as the Spaniards started to settle um, missions on up uh, the, the the trail, uh, it took on the name the mission varietal, of course. And then that's what was planted up and along the state of California. Mm. And so, yes, the Mission Grape had a foothold here for a while. However, it was really the Italian immigrants that came over from uh, the East Coast and then were able to source eventually some Zinfandel. Because they didn't necessarily bring the clippings, although that's uh, very romantic and everything, and, and maybe in some cases it did happen. Um, but Zinfandel was what was more readily available uh, to be able to be planted um, by them for their own purposes. So mm -hmm. the Mission Grape kind of found its way as a sacramental wine for quite some time, uh, but then it was really um, these European immigrants that really helped to establish vineyards from not only their own use, but from a commercial standpoint. And, you know, it's interesting having so many varietals, right, and, and this long legacy of wine out there. Um, I always look at Central California. I mean, it's like the whole Central Valley, the Central Coast is really big on, on agriculture. And, of course, that brings in wineries. Um, the growing has got to be good out there because of it seems like from just driving out there, you've got, you know, the ocean breezes, you've got a little bit of like dry terrain, right, as well as um, kind of like little valleys. It, it looks all different everywhere. So does that help in the whole growing process? Oh, absolutely. I think what where the common tie is from this region to so many other regions in California and all over the world is poor soil and that, that sounds absolutely you know completely against the grain of course but that's exactly what's important when it comes to growing wine grapes is, is that they don't want a fertile soil they need a soil that they struggle in because it's remember it's all a sense of place right it's all you want those grapevines to, to struggle and, and to find um, you know moisture and to extract that flavor out of, of what is unique from that special place that's being grown in for us, we happen to have very calcareous soil. Uh, and so that means a high pH, which what ends mm -hmm. up meaning is a high acid, natural acidity in wine, because we all love a little acid in our wine. We all like the tannin, we all like the fruit. So that's where we get that combination. But we also, as you were saying, those ocean breezes, we have the Santa Lucia mountain range in between us and the Pacific Ocean. And we have a really special relationship with the Santa Lucia mountain range and the Pacific Ocean in that we have just an ever so slight dip 
in overall elevation parallel between us and the ocean. Uh, and over on the ocean side, there's this great big bay called Estero Bay. Mm. And with the warm temperatures over on this side of the mountain range mixing with those cooler, moist temperatures over at the ocean, it, uh, it makes this vacuum effect that, that also creates fo a fog bank. And as that fog bank rolls in and presses against the Santa Lucia mountain range, it creates a breeze every day. And nice. so what we enjoy is sometimes 90 degree temperatures during the day in the summer but we'll get down to about 50 at night. And that's just so incredibly great for growing wine grapes because they get all of that sunlight uh, during the day, but then they get to cool off and, and, and settle overnight. Well, that means, you know, you've got, okay, you've got wine, you've got this amazing climate and temperature. Uh, Dana, does that mean outdoor recreation? Because it looks beautiful, you know, from what we saw. It looks really beautiful. Do people go out hiking and cycling and bird watching? Absolutely. Um, we've got some amazing natural assets uh, in the Paso Robles area, including Lake Nacimiento, that is a, uh, a wildlife habitat uh, place to visit. Um, uh, bald eagles are out there, um, certainly fish and other types of birds that are through that area. So there's some great wildlife viewing out that direction. And then we've got some amazing country roads that allow for some wonderful cycling experiences. And when we say country roads, I mean, literally there may be a couple of vehicles that pass by, but for the most part, it's you and your, and your um, bike on the road. And you get to go through these rolling hills that are capped with uh, surrounding oak trees and the vineyards that we see along with some of the horse and cattle ranches that are out there. And so you have this amazing vista. And then certainly um, we've got some uh, other uh, um, outdoor recreation activities that uh, are down in the Santa Margarita area, um, zip lining that takes place. So we've kind of got you covered with uh, the ability to get outdoors and enjoy the natural space and the, the natural occurring weather conditions that we have here that um, are quite enjoyable. Now, mm. It does get warm here in the summertime, but that doesn't uh, prevent us from getting outside. Um, and, and as Chris said, that certainly helps our, our growing of our grapes. It also encourages us to really be outdoors and enjoy uh, as much of that sunshine as we possibly can. When I, was, yeah. I know, Nancy, I'm like, let's mm -hmm. go bird watching. I want to go to the nature place and, and do that. You know, the one thing I love about vineyards is it's really you know, when you go to an AVA that's it's thriving, it, it turns into this major destination where you, you get to enjoy wine, but then, you know, here comes um, kind of like the, the boutique hotels and inns and bed and breakfasts, and then here comes music in the vineyards and art. It just kind of, it, it wine says, come on, everybody, let's have a party. <laughs> let's, let's, you know, have a really cool destination. Uh, do you have concerts and weddings and things like that, uh, Dana, in, in, with all the vineyards around? As like oh, the backdrop. Yeah, and, and that's a, a great way to describe it. I think it's an evolution. And, and so it's not just a visit to a tasting room uh, any longer. It's a visit to the tasting room and winery experience. And now we have so many of our wineries that have amazing venues that they have built um, either inside or outside that provides concerts um, featuring local musicians. We have the Vina Robles Amphitheater that has a season that runs from uh, April into October that features world class. Uh, Willie Nelson was here earlier this year. Yay. And, uh, so, you know, it's a wide variety of live entertainment in this 3000 person amphitheater. Um, but then, you know, also uh, we've got restaurants in the area that feature um, live music. We've got breweries that are now emerging in the area with live music. And so what's really exciting is that we've, we've had this growth of, of live entertainment that's taking place here in Paso Robles. And um, you, on any given night, literally, uh, you can pop into a restaurant, um, a, a, a bar area, um, and even the wineries uh, that are having their own live entertainment activities and sit back and enjoy some great music that's, that's right here in Paso. Oh, man. That's this perfect. Is, I know, Nancy, this is getting better and better. I know. <laughs> I know. So uh, the one thing I, I noticed also, Paso Market Walk is coming up in February 2020. And this sounds good because it, there's like, you got chocolate, you got gardens and wine. <laughs> it oh, sounds good. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we couldn't be more excited about this new um, addition to the assets that we have here in town. It's, it's going to be a slight extension of, of our downtown 
And so it'll be just a few blocks off of our main uh, central downtown park area. And it will feature a chocolatier, a charcuterie, a, a butcher shop. Uh, it will have a restaurant there. It's also going to have a, uh, what I would call a sustainable garden uh, demonstration and oh. nursery. And uh, when we think about a place like Paso Robles and, and California in general, you know, there's, there's interest in wanting to um, grow sustainably. And so this garden and nursery is intended to be, uh, be that kind of a demonstration for people to learn techniques and what plants um, can uh, survive in drought and still provide uh, beauty in the garden. So uh, it's going to be a great respite area for mm -hmm. folks coming into town, uh, get a bite to eat or purchase the little um, snack that you want to take with you as you're out visiting these, our, our wineries um, and also a place to have a lovely dinner. There will also be some accommodations attached to it. So you'll have the uh, ability to actually sleep right there in the market walk in one of the, the guest cottages that they're building there. So we couldn't be more excited about it. And uh, it's coming uh, in February of, of 2020 and mm -hmm. excited to have it be a part of, of our downtown experience. And, you know, talking about lodging, I think that's an important thing. Um, you know, I was reading too that Condé Nast Traveler, uh, you, you got some good accolades out there uh, for some of your resorts and inns and um, you've got new hotels coming in. So it seems like you kind of run the gamut, give everybody an idea of what, what, the, what the lodging experience is. Right. So I appreciate that word. I think we do run the gamut here. And uh, first and foremost, uh, actually just coming up here in October, um, our newest hotel will be opening up. It's called the Piccolo. It's a um, luxury boutique property that's being built in downtown Paso Robles. It is being um, managed and owned by the company who um, oversees the historic Paso Robles Inn. Mm. And so that family has uh, built this new property, boutique style lodging with 23 rooms and the only rooftop bar in Paso Robles. Ooh. And so uh, it, it's, it's going to be quite exciting to have that. Earlier this year, we also opened the Oxford Suites, which is a 101-room property, and each of their guest rooms are suite-type products, and it features a bistro for dining and a bar area, and it's a great salute to uh, some of our additional agricultural heritage. Back in the day, uh, we were an almond capital, and uh, the location of this hotel is actually on the site of the former Cal Al uh, almond processing plant. And so some of their um, art and amenities in their guest rooms reflect that uh, almond heritage here in Paso. And then the third property that opened uh, just a couple of months ago is Hotel Siri. And it's a 37 room property just up the road from the Paso Robles Event Center, where so many of our activities take place and uh, quite a, a comfort, uh, comforted, uh, comfortable lodging uh, location um, with some great amenities in that guest room. Mm. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about a couple of our resorts in the community. You mentioned the Condé Nast Reader's Choice yeah. Award, uh, Hotel Cheval, which is downtown Paso Robles, uh, 16 boutique style rooms, uh, was a top luxury hotel, as well as the Ad Allegretto Vineyard Resort, that uh, is a little taste of Tuscany here in Paso Robles and has the only sonic labyrinth that I'm familiar with. Uh, <laughs> part of its amenities, along with some bocce ball and some evening um, fire pits uh, for sitting out and enjoying our, our lovely uh, rural evenings here. Oh man, fire pits man. sound good to me. Sounds like fun. <laughs> I know. I I love this roof, rooftop bar. That that's mm. I'm into that. I wanted to go back to you, Chris, because you know, as a, a coming in, people may just fly in from New York or you know from anywhere to come out. Paso's you know world renowned, um, but when they come out. To me, I'm like, okay, the last thing I want to do is get behind the wheel and start, you know, wine tasting and driving around. Are there different tour companies that can take you around so you can enjoy the views and sip your wine and not worry about, you know, doing any oopsies on the road? Oh, absolutely. And we highly, of course, recommend that. We think that uh, being uh, responsible when you're out tasting is uh, how you can continue tasting. So whether you're designating a driver yourself um, practicing the uh, four S's of tasting, you know, swirl, mm -hmm. sniff, sip, and spit, 
Um, but either way, hiring a tour company is highly recommended. We, we have a whole list of them on our website, PasoWine.com, mm-hmm. where you can do everything from getting yourself your own driver that will literally drive your car <laughs> from place to place or getting onto a tour bus um, that could be chartered or it could be a hop on hop off uh, style tour bus. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, forms of, of transportation that can get you around to all of the wineries. Uh, and it's just a matter of what your preference is. If you want to mm. meet some new people and do a hop on hop off, that could be fun. And, or if you have your own group and you feel like chartering a bus and doing a custom tour, that's available to you. What about for those who like are interested in wine, um, but you know, want to actually go more into a, you know, educational part of it and start and learn because that's, I know at one point, you know, the wine industry had to kind of lighten up a little bit and and let people in and (laughs) say, listen, we can have fun with this. You you know, Um, you don't have to wear high heels to go wine tasting. (laughs) So that's a great question. Uh, Let's start with tour companies. There are actually a couple of tour companies in town that are run by people who are certified sommeliers. And so by taking those tour tours, and seeking them out, you can not only have you know a great experience as you're tra- traveling around, but now your tour operator, your your driver, if you will, is also an experienced sommelier who will be able to add some educational elements to it. Not only teaching you, let's say, about our region, but maybe even helping to equate our wines with other wines that you might be uh, knowledgeable about. Let's just say you're completely new to. Uh, wine tasting, that's okay. I think what the beauty of our region is, is that the people behind the tasting bars, whether they be um, some of the the tasting room attendants or the winemakers and owners themselves, were very open to new people coming in and getting to know wine in our area. Um, There are many wineries who offer educational opportunities for them, like tours, so you can have a biodynamic tour or a cave tour or some sort of a vineyard tour. Uh, so many of them even offer opportunities like you were asking about, say, the outdoors, mm-hmm. horseback riding in the vineyard, or even Ooh. bird watching in the vineyard, and things like that all exist and somehow, of course, tie back into this educational component of understanding where the grapes are coming from uh, in that bottle of wine that you're drinking. And it's actually searchable on our website on PasaWine.com. When you search for winery, you can search by winery and then you can search by amenities and you can look for educational opportunities as well. I think that's a cool part. Nancy, that's something we always look for, right, is the guides, people giving us a, you know, some, you know, especially the history of a region to understand, you know, how much work went into it. Yeah. Yeah, we like the inside scoop. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I appreciate that. You've got a great map on there, everyone. PasoWine.com. Uh, the other website, of course, you want to go travel Paso.com as well. And then especially they have a lot in regards to uh, shopping and um, all the different attractions and what you want to do with your families. And it looks like that uh, Dana, I know we're talking about wine and, you know, like getting out there and having fun, but it also looks like Paso is really, especially with all these resorts, developed into becoming a meeting destination. Oh, yes, it has actually. Um, we're starting to see more and more groups that are coming into the area because of the hotels that we have that feature some meeting space. We also have the Paso Robles Event Center that is attracting large um, agriculture related shows and or uh, tremendous equestrian events that are coming from around the, the country um, to, to show their horses uh, here um, and compete for prize money here at the event center. And so we've got a diversity of, um, of uh, accommodations and meeting space that uh, people are starting to find. The other part to that story is the central location and accessibility. And so that's what we're starting to see is from Northern and Southern California meeting planners and event organizers who are looking for a central location and accessibility, and they're finding it here uh, in the Paso Robles area. 
Mm, that's very cool. Very cool. Now, uh, some upcoming events. Let's let's let people know what's happening because that's always a great way to you know get into a new uh, region if you haven't visited is to go to an event and and explore a region that way. And of course, I, I've got to bring up that you've got Hearst Castle in your backyard. I mean, excuse us, <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. There, there. Yeah. Oh, and then there's Hearst Castle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So right, yeah. So no. Thanks for bringing it up because. It is literally 30 minutes away, a, a very quick drive um, over the Santa Lucia range that Chris talked about, and a very accessible uh, to Paso Robles, as is the, the beach, uh, very accessible. But um, we also have uh, several different events that are what we would consider those annual events that people flock mm. to Paso Robles to participate in. And actually, in 2020, there's a couple of big anniversaries that we have coming up. Um, our uh, California Mid-State Fair is celebrating 75 years mm. of showcasing our livestock and agricultural heritage. And uh, that's uh, held every year uh, in 2020. It's July 22nd through August 2nd. 12 days of fun, fair food. Uh, certainly wine tasting, uh, breweries. Uh, we also have, the, as I said, the big livestock shows and some large name entertainment that comes to town for that fair. Um, also in 2020, we'll be celebrating the 90th anniversary of our Pioneer Day. And you might think that that's really a reflection of our pioneering heritage. And it was um, started as a way to thank uh, the folks living in the rural area for coming into town and conducting their commerce activities. And also, if we think about uh, 90 years ago, we were in the middle of a, of a recession and uh, mm -hmm. recovering from that. And this was a way to kind of celebrate the completion of harvest, but also celebrate the commerce that was happening here in Paso. And a thank you back to those, uh, those consumers that were here. So 90 mm -hmm. years of celebration. Uh, we've got a big parade that goes with it. Uh, we celebrate the harvesters and the restored tractors that are on display in the parade. And it's really about a 10 day fun uh, list of activities to, uh, to connect us back to our agricultural heritage here in town. Um, from a wine perspective, we've got amazing events that happen mm. every year. Uh, Chris and his organization produce three um, awesome events. In the March, we've got the Vintage Weekend, that's a salute to that Zinfandel heritage. And then the third week in May is the annual wine festival. And then also in October uh, is our annual harvest weekend. But also in 2020 here in Paso Robles, it uh, will be the year of Hospice de Rhone. And that is a global celebration of the Rhone varietals that calls Paso Robles home every other year. And in 2020, they'll be here in uh, May, at, also at the Paso Robles Event Center. If you are a Rhone fan, uh, Hospice de Rhone is the place for you to be. Awesome. This is amazing, ma'am. Uh, okay, so I have to ask each of you our happy hour question. It just don't you think, Nancy, <laughs> they have to play happy hour because they're sitting in wine country here. Um, and so the happy hour question is, if you could spend happy hour with anyone, anyone in the world, alive or passed on, who would it be? Where are you going to take them in Paso? And what are you going to drink? We, we have to know about the food because I, I hear you guys have some awesome food too. And of course, we want the gossip. So let's start with you, Chris. Where are you going <laughs> or who are you taking? <laughs> it could be Mick Jagger. I don't know why he came to mind, but um, <laughs> well, that'd be interesting. Know, I, I would, uh, <laughs> uh, because we had this conversation, almost exact conversation, like just yesterday in our wow. office. Wow. <laughs> um, it, it, the answer comes easy. It would be Anthony Bourdain. Yay! <laughs> um, because I would just love, I mean, it, when I think back on him, I always mm. thought to myself, it's not if, but when yeah. I meet Anthony Bourdain. Oh. I'd love to have a drink with him, right? And so, and unfortunately, that time has passed. Uh, but that's who I would pick. I would, you know, it's not necessarily going exactly to a place, but rather to some sort of a hilltop cool location in Paso where we have a view of vineyards and a view of mm. that Santa Lucia mountain range. Uh, I would want it to be sitting back eating a couple of, and I know this sounds crazy, but this is so Anthony Bourdain in my head, a couple of Al Pastor tacos. 
with a nice <laughs> bottle of Syrah from Paso mm. and just sitting there and just chatting yeah. it up to sunset. And that's our dinner, followed up by going into town and honestly going and getting a cocktail. Yeah. Now, where would you go for a cocktail? I would probably go to the Hatch in Paso um, because they have such great cocktails there. Uh, my favorite being the Grandpa's uh, uh, Old Fashioned. Uh, mm. That is by far one of the best old fashions I've ever had in all my travels around. <laughs> See, cool. And that's where <laughs> I would go. You know what? He always has like the night on the town. So I know that's kind of like you've got the beginning. What would you do at the end food wise? Because he knows, he knows he needs soakage at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the end of the night. Okay. So at the hatch, what they have there, it is kind of seasonal, but I love, um, they have a grilled octopus that they do. Uh, they've got this Mary's fried chicken and they also have chicharrones. And all of that stuff, it's fatty and it's delicious. And um, that's a nice way to end the night. Oh, man, you guys are having a party in Paso. That's it. <laughs> that, that, that would be my, the title of my article, Party in Paso. <laughs> it's the way to go. Dana, okay, so who are you going out uh, for happy hour with? Yeah, so pressure's on because uh, Anthony Bourdain is a great one. Um, I'm going to go back just a little bit further. One of my heroes uh, and someone that I would have, I think I would have wanted to have, I know I would have wanted to have met and been a contemporary. Teddy Roosevelt is oh, yeah. um, a significant uh, hero of mine and somebody that I've always looked up to. And I, I love his uh, reading about his time spent in the West um, mm -hmm. when he came out, you know, to that, to the Montana area and where he, you know, kind of honed his, his Western skills and his connection to the natural landscape and the natural place. And um, so I, Teddy is one that I would welcome greatly to Paso Robles. Um, kind of similar to, to Chris, actually, um, we've got some amazing vistas here in Paso Robles. And there's a few that come to mind that uh, we'd go sit out on that deck. Um, I would be opening up um, a bottle of uh, one of our cabs uh, from Paso Robles. I think uh, Teddy's kind of that rich bodied person. And I think uh, he would enjoy one of our, one of our cabs. Um, for for dinner, um, we're gonna have a tri-tip barbecue and sit out uh, with the, some meat and some beans and uh, a, a little green salad to mix in, and uh, and enjoy that sunset going down uh, in that vista that we'd be um, searching for. As far as the end of the evening, we'll come back into town and we'll head over to 1122, which is our local speakeasy here in town. Oh, sweet. And, uh, you know, have one of their uh, bartenders mix up one of their versions of the, some true um, uh, old fashioned type uh, cocktails. My favorite one happens to be uh, a smoked uh, mezcal uh, espresso cocktail that is quite tasty and quite lovely. And uh, we'd take Teddy over there and sit in the speakeasy and listen to some music uh, from days gone by. And then as we head out to uh, probably, I, I think that Teddy has a little bit of a sweet tooth in him. And uh, I think we'd head over to um, one of the uh, ice cream shops here in town and grab a little bowl of ice cream to end the evening and, uh, and call it good. I dig that. Teddy, I want to sit and talk to him about his time with John Muir. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, right? Uh, yeah. Can you imagine the two of them talking and sharing whatever yeah. ideas? Had, I, I would have loved to have sat next to them. So I agree. Uh, I, that would have been fun. And he was a rough rider. I mean, it's like his yeah. history. I, I, I would like to put him with, I don't know, for some reason, this just came to my head. This is just the odd party, right? Take Teddy and Benjamin Franklin and sit them down <laughs> with some wine and see what happens. You know, I know Benjamin Franklin loves his wine. Uh, Teddy, yeah, I think Teddy's, Teddy's a cocktail dude. I see him with like, I don't oh, yeah. know, like a nice strong bourbon or, you know, but uh, what, what a great conversation. Thank you both for joining us and giving us an overview of Paso. Everyone, again, the website's uh, travelpaso.com. 
Paso.com, also PasoWine.com. Obviously, there's a party in Paso. <laughs> so I'm going to be walking around saying that all day long now. Um, we want to thank the International Food Wine Travel Writers Association once again for uh, putting this together with us. Uh, you can go to their website, ifwtwa.org, a great place for travel writers, foodies, and destinations to connect, and especially if you like wine. And uh, everyone, don't forget, keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com. Our shows air Sunday through uh, Thursday, and the schedule is up there. You can listen as they go live or later on demand. And we're going to play some music for you both because, you know, you're, you're out in Paso. There's a wonderful guitarist who I know um, it lives in your region and performs in your region. His name is Jim Stubblefield. I don't know if you've heard of him, but a wonderful guitarist. So we're going to play uh, the song Terra Bella from his album, Inspiration. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 